Former Aussie guitarist J.K. Lee has ripped Ingve Malmsteen, belittling his guitar prowess and branding him an arrogant fucking asshole. Jake said on the Talk To Me podcast, via Blabbermouth. He's a dick, that's my main problem with him. He's an arrogant fucking asshole, and he always has been. I don't know if he is right now, to be honest, I haven't seen him in forever. But I can only assume that if when you're younger, you're that arrogant and that big of a dick, that you really never change. So I assume he still is. But no, he was just, he was a dick. And he was a great guitar player. But even then, he was really good at one little thing that he does, doing the sweeps and arpeggios and playing fast, and that's all he could do. That's one of my problems with him, it's a very narrow band of guitar playing. He just focuses on this one part. He's a shitty rhythm player, he can't write a song worth a fuck. And I'm saying this, and this sounds bad, I feel a little bit bad. But knowing what an asshole he is, I don't feel that bad. You can't be that arrogant if you're only really good at one, minute aspect of the art of playing guitar. And that's all he was. And, yeah, fuck him. Richie Blackmore was asked in an interview with Guitar World magazine what he thought about Ingve Malmsteen, as he often credits him as a big influence. He's always been very nice to me, and I always get on very well with him. I don't understand him, though, his playing, what he wears. His movements are also a bit creepy. Normally you say, well, the guy's just an idiot. But, when you hear him play you think, this guy's no idiot. He knows what he's doing. He's got to calm down. He's not Paganini, though he thinks he is. When Ingve can break all of his strings but one, and play the same piece on one string, then I'll be impressed. In three or four years, we'll probably hear some good stuff from him. He also gave his opinion on guitar tapping, and how he is happy to see the last of it. Thank goodness it's come to an end. The first person I saw doing that hammer out stuff was Harvey Mandel, at the Whiskey A Go-Go in 68. I thought what the hell is he doing? It was so funny, laughs. Jim Morrison was carried out because he was shouting abuse at the band. Jimi Hendrix was there. We were all getting drunk. Then Harvey Mandel starts doing this stuff, mimes tapping. What's he doing? Everybody was saying. Even the audience stopped dancing. Joe Satriani recently spoke about what it was like to replace Richie Blackmore in Deep Purple from 1993 and 94, admitting it was a bit of an intimidating gig. He said, I did feel a bit like a rookie. I was just a couple of years into the sort of accidental career as an instrumentalist, and then all of a sudden I get this call to replace a legend. You can't replace somebody like Richie Blackmore. So I kind of knew it was gonna be a thankless job from the fans' point of view, who have already bought tickets to the shows. There was a level of uncomfortableness, but I think it was all in my head. I think anybody who walks out on stage knowing that they're not the guy that the audience knows and loves, that they're the replacement, they've got a little mental game they've got to play every night they're on stage. They have to kinda try not to think like the audience. But I couldn't help it. I was such a big fan of Deep Purple and such a great fan of Richie Blackmore. There was a lot of sort of internal battles going on where every time I go to play Smoke on the Water, I would just hear every single note in detail that Richie played and I kept thinking, why play it any different? That's perfect. But, of course, the guys in the band really wanted me to be Joe. They just kept saying, do whatever you want Joe. We'd love to hear your style over this. Forget about Richie. And it was impossible for me because I grew up listening and trying to imitate Richie Blackmore, as any young kid my age would, growing up when I did. So the experience was exhilarating. It was super fun because I was so excited to play with a legendary band, still mildly starstruck, even though I got to know these guys very well. On Vancouver radio station CFOX, Metallica's Kirk Hammett spoke fairly candidly about his experience taking guitar lessons with Joe Satriani. It was actually very poignant, Hammett said of his first lesson with Satriani. His first lesson to me was, learn your lesson. Don't waste your time, don't waste my time. I expect you to know everything that I gave you in a week's time. I was, like, this guy is serious. But you know what? I did it, and he kicked my ass. But after a while, I was taking two lessons a week from him. I became so thirsty for what he had to offer me, I was just, like, bring it on. It's all making sense. I wanna learn more. Hammett then discussed Satriani as a player, saying ever since I first met him, 
he's always played incredibly, with all the sounds and all the bar stuff and tapping and crazy licks that no one's ever played and still probably never plays. I mean, he's just such a unique individual as a musician. Joe Satriani commented on Richie Blackmore calling him a solace, too polished player in an archived interview that was recently published out into the open, Joe Satriani said to Mitch Lafin, via Blabbermouth, well, it's unfortunate when somebody that you look up to has something negative to say about you. So that part will always hurt. I wouldn't hide my feelings about that. I get criticized on both sides of the fence for the opposite offenses. And I don't quite understand it other than most of the time, when someone has criticism, it's because they're challenged and they feel that they have to strike out. So I get it, I understand why he would have to say something negative. I can kind of laugh at it because I'm not like that myself. I tend to just look at the positive of another musician and focus on that. This is what Richie Blackmore said about Joe Satriani. Me, listen to Joe Satriani, he's a, a brilliant player. But I never see him, I never really hear him searching for notes. I never hear him playing maybe a wrong note. Jimi Hendrix used to play lots of wrong notes because he was searching all the time. Where the hell is that, that, that correct note? And when he did find that right note, wow, that was incredible. But if you're always playing the correct notes, there's something wrong. You're not searching, you're not reaching for anything. Um, but that's not to say that I mean, he is a very brilliant player, same as Steve Morse, fantastic player. I'm just glad they found a guitar player to carry on because I thought I was going to be shackled to this band for the rest of my life. You know, it was like a ball and chain thing. And luckily they said, well, we found someone. Thank God I can get out. You know? I think that um, I don't really, I, I haven't listened much. I just know that Joe Satriani and Steve Morse are brilliant players. And I, I remember Steve Morse with the Dixie Drakes, fantastic stuff. Um, I think um, I think what you're, you, you mean may be that certain people play from the heart and other ple people play from the head. <clears throat> um, I prefer a heart player. I prefer someone like um, a blues player with the, uh, the guy that plays uh, Jeff Healy. Jeff Healy, I think, is tremendous. I think the John Mayall guy is great too. Um, people like that I prefer. If I hear someone really technical and running up and down the fingerboard, I can hear that for a couple of minutes. Then I, I start to get kind of bored and I'm thinking of other things, like playing football or something. But um, I do like to hear someone reaching for something, you know, not quite making it, and sometimes they do make it. And they're very polished, like with Joe Satrani, it's a very polished player, almost too polished. That's what worries me sometimes. But um, it's um, different strokes for different folks, as an enemy of mine used to say, um, which is such a corny saying. Um, it's, it's whatever, some people are into that head music, that head technique, some people are into the heart technique, some people are into blues technique. I personally am into the minstrel technique. If I hear someone playing a lute or playing a crumb horn, it just moves me. I, I don't know why, um, guitar players I find kind of boring. And that's not meant as a dig. I just, I find myself boring and I have to go and lock myself away. It's, the guitar is a wonderful instrument in certain ways. Like if you're listening to someone like John Williams play, then you know the man can play. And he will play a fast piece, a slow piece. He will emote, he has it down. That's just awe inspiring to hear someone like that. I think the main objective is to move make people think in their heart. I personally am not interested in appealing to other musicians. I would, I have more of a, I, to me it's more inspiring to move someone who doesn't know anything about music, but has feel. They can say, I, I don't know what you're doing, but I just feel that something there. That to me is an incredible compliment. Whereas opposed to, well, you just run up and down the fingerboard, that's, that's wonderful, very fast. Really all that means is I've just practiced the hell out of the, the guitar. I'm not really saying anything. I'm going from A to B, but not seeing anything on the way. Tool frontman Maynard James Keenan said that very technical players like Joe Satriani aren't his cup of tea, noting they lack humanity and tend to be a little stiff by his standards.
The musician told Destroy All Lines, I've worked with a lot of people over the years that are very technical and very good at what they do, but they are not necessarily creative. The creative force is where some of the best music comes from. Not from guys who, no disrespect to Joe Satriani, those kind of very technical school players, I think a lot of times they lack humanity. There's not a lot of breath that comes out of the music that I hear from, I don't want to say educated, indoctrinated musicians tend to be a little stiff. That living, breathing interaction with mistakes, with not necessarily perfect approaches, that tends to give the music the character, that melds really well, if you do it's right, it melds well with the digital. Not only that but Maynard also expressed his opinions recently on how most musicians today have a problem with being too one-dimensional, explaining the whole issue to Rolling Stone, saying, I think bands in general, not necessarily the ones I'm involved in, but I think bands in general kind of have the discipline enough to learn how to play their instrument. And they have some kind of accolades or positive reinforcement for some achievements they might have had early on. Playing guitar, playing drums, so you know, as human beings you like that praise, you like those accolades. So you pursue it more to get more of those things. He added, but in general, most musicians nowadays, and in recent history, they lack the discipline outside of that one discipline. So in a way, they're one-dimensional, so when success comes, they don't have the faintest idea how to deal with it. And most of them implode. Most of them fall apart. They didn't have the discipline back then, they just had the discipline on what their single focus was, whatever instrument it was. Mastodon guitarist Bill Keller admitted he's not the biggest fan of such guitar masters like Joe Satriani and Steve Vai, saying that although they are insane guitar players, their style can force him. Asked by Total Guitar on where do you find most players are going wrong, Bill replied, a big mistake people often make is trying to add too many notes and overcomplicating their ideas. I always try to tell people that it's best to come up with a simple rhythmic idea and then paint in the higher notes to make these tiny adjustments into new chords, using notes as semitone out. That can make all the difference to a song. It's not about how fast you play. A lot of people just know scales. Look at Joe Satriani or Steve Vai, they're both insane guitar players, but I went to see Satch once, and I got bored after a couple of minutes. All he did was shred through scales constantly. I guess it sounds cool, if you're into it, but I was thinking, play a goddamn riff. I guess that makes me a riff guy. During the rest of the chat, Keller further discussed the importance of mastering the rhythm aspect of guitar playing, saying, I can't stress the importance of rhythm enough. For me, it's better to get a cool rhythm going and then figure the notes out later when you think about what emotion you want to convey to the listener. Is it super evil? If not, use it as a stepping stone to your next idea and eventually you'll have 123 different riffs at your disposal. It's like a painting, you start with an idea, which is a rhythm, and then you use musical pencils to draw your idea. For me, the sketch is the root notes and the melody is how you fill it out where the emotion of the song comes from. Listen to the intro to Blood and Thunder, which Brandaler actually came up with, but he didn't write it on guitar, he just hummed me the riff. It has to have that rhythm, otherwise it completely loses its feel. Guitar virtuoso Joe Satriani explained why he started wearing sunglasses and how it ended up being one of the staple marks of his image. In a recent interview he said, the sunglasses thing happened as a joke. I surprised my band on tour by showing up with my head shaved. And they were so horrified that they said I had to wear a hat and glasses or they wouldn't stop laughing on stage. Then I realized that having that curtain to hide behind allowed me to be more creative and feel less self-conscious. My buddy Sammy Hager feels the same way. He says he can't go on stage without sunglasses because he's so embarrassed to be a singer. He's the last person you'd expect to think that way. He was also asked to single out his least favorite aspect of showbiz which he replied, saying, being around people. It's a major drawback, right? Like, if my manager called me and said, you'll be meeting 50 people every day before the show, immediately I'd start getting butterflies in my stomach. It's silly. I mean, I'm a grown-up, and I've been doing this my whole life, and still my initial reaction is, don't do it. Even Slash back in 2015 with the New Zealand Herald explained, 
why he would rarely ever take his glasses off, this is what he said, I rarely look out at the crowd. It makes me very uncomfortable to look directly into the face of the crowd. I'm in my own little world, playing my guitar. I play from the heart, but it's very insular. I think it was just a hangover thing that turns into an everyday thing. Now, wherever you go, everybody's got camera phones taking your picture and you just end up never taking the shades off.